So when it comes to tuning cars and modify them, things have certainly changed substantially over the years. So this video, we're just going to look at some of the big changes that have happened in the world of tuning. And the question that we really want to get an answer to is, is it easier to tune cars nowadays or is it harder? Are there any pros and cons with all the developments that have gone on over the years with engines and engine development and the technologies that go into it? Or would we be better off going back to an older engine? But I would love to hear your experiences of tuning the world of cars over the years. What cars have you had over the years? What did you start off with? What have you got now? Um, what's your opinion of the way that tuning cars has changed and evolved over the years? Do you think we're now in a golden age of tuning? Or do you think that was a few years ago? <laughs> So early engines didn't use any kind of fuel injection system. They used a carburetor and the way the carb actually worked, it would have a little needle and as the air would flow over the needle, that would create a vacuum within the needle, causing the fuel to go up from the reservoir into the airstream. So the faster the airstream was going, the more fuel it would pull and it was crude effective and simple. There's very little that can go wrong with such a simple mechanism, but it worked quite well. The big problem with that setup though, was that you were getting a very set ratio of fuel to the air mixture. So in a modern engine, you really have a lot more control using the injection system and the computer, and you can force the engine to run rich or lean or somewhere in between the two, depending on the conditions, whether the engine is under load, whether it is warming up. So in those days gone by, you used to have to have a manual choke that you would pull out to rich up that air fuel mixture. So when you were tuning one of the old engines with a carb, it was very much a compromise. You would get the peak power a very finite point in your RPM range, and it would be very hard to spread the peak power across the RPM range. So one of the big advantages we've got nowadays is fuel injection systems and the way the fuel goes into the engine. You get a lot more control over the amount of fuel, and in some cases, even the spray pattern of the fuel as it goes into the engine itself, which has a big bearing on the engine's ability to actually use that fuel. So emission standards have always been creeping up and getting tighter and tighter and it's led to lots of ancillary bolt-ons in the engine. You've got your catalyst, your DPF filters and a whole series of other systems like your EGR valves that actually help to keep those emissions below whatever the legal limits are and you can bet that those legal limits of emissions are going to get ever more stringent and harder to meet. But that has pushed the manufacturers to develop engines to make them more efficient. And a more efficient engine actually gives you more power from the fuel that you're using. But most manufacturers have actually used that to trim the amount of fuel that you need to achieve the set power figure. So they're not specifically doing it for performance. So on an old engine, what you would be typically doing when tuning it is trying to raise its efficiency, get it to burn the fuel more effectively, to extract more power from that fuel. And there was a massive margin, the way the heads were cast, the way the valves were designed, and really every other component within the engine, it, it left a lot of scope for a person to come along and improve improve that and create something better. But with modern manufacturing, there's a lot more development and research that has gone into each and every engine. Computer aided design has really optimised those channels going into the engine through the head, the design of the cylinders, the stroke, the pistons themselves, and they really are very good at maximising the amount of power that you get from the fuel itself. So in a way, a modern engine is less liable to respond to tuning than maybe an older engine, but on the flip side, you're already getting a lot more power out of a modern engine that you would have done out of a, an older engine. So with modern engines, you've also got an ECU, which is basically a computer that stores a map of the timing, the fuel, the air mix, and it's continually monitoring what's going on in the engine by means of sensors. And it can adjust things very, very quickly and just prevent the engine from damaging itself. So you would have situations that might cause detonation or knock where the fuel mixture ignites improperly inside the cylinder. And and having a modern system, you can run very close to that knock limit. So you're maximizing the amount of power that you can get out of the engine itself. But again, manufacturers have backed off from the optimum. They've given themselves a fairly wide margin to play in. So most cars and particularly turbocharged cars respond really well to alterations within the map. So although the skill set has somewhat changed from the days where you had to set your carbs and set the jets up properly, the 
potential power gains that you get from plugging a computer in and adjusting those parameters it is certainly a, a great era to currently live in. But we know that a lot of manufacturers are actually pushing locked ECUs out. It's quite hard to change the ECU in a lot of modern engines that are coming out. So there's always ways around it. Manufacturers of these uh, tuning boxes and uh, tuning companies themselves are always devising ways of optimizing the maps. We've got a whole host of aftermarket ECUs that can bolt on and completely replace that locked factory ECU, giving you a lot more control over the engine and the way that it burns the power itself. So turbocharger design has also come a long way with uh, modern casting processes, modern designs. The technologies that they're using in turbos is far more advanced than those early turbos that came out 30, 40, 50 years ago. And we've got twin scroll turbos now, which really do aid the scavenging effect of the engine. They improve the efficiency of the way the cylinders empty and pull in new air. So it's not just the turbo itself that's pushing more air into the engine. The whole system has been designed to work together and to work really effectively. So in some cases, if you've got a car with an older turbo, you can get a lot of benefit just by going to a modern turbo that's maybe been manufactured to higher tolerances and it's got a better design it can flow more air maybe it can spool up more quickly but certainly you can get a turbo to match the characteristics that you want from your engine to get that power band exactly where you need it to be the other thing that us tuners have got to worry about when we start modifying our cars is keeping the car legal and in most areas a lot of modifications are now illegal so the options you've got on improving your car and making it more efficient seem to be getting narrower and narrower and in some states and regions it's almost impossible to tune your car and adapt it in any way and it remain legal to use on the road. So that's a rather sad modern development because a lot of these tuned engines are actually still quite efficient. Although they're making more power, they usually emit less gases as a result of that extra power that's coming out. So you could certainly argue that you're improving the engine, you're improving its efficiency. Although with the extra power, you're obviously burning more fuel overall, so the emissions will go up. But it would be fairer really if a car could be graded on what it is, rather than have to meet a set factor standard that has been locked and pre-decided. If you could take your car in, get it measured and actually pay duty, road tax or, or whatever the legalities are in your country to get that car on the road and make it legal. Annual inspections are also getting tighter and tighter. They're checking more and more things. So in some areas, any kind of dashboard warning light, a check engine light, for example, would instantly result in a failure of that annual inspection. So the maintenance responsibility on each driver is much higher than it ever used to be, which in my book is a good thing. It makes sure that people's cars are safe and efficient and minimizes the amount of accidents and problems that you would get from having badly maintained cars out there. So we've also noticed manufacturers focusing on profits. There was the uh, financial crisis in 2008 and most manufacturers had a noticeable dip in the quality, in the reliability of the engines that they produced during that financial crisis. They tended to source cheaper components or sourcing components became hard. So maybe they made some compromises and the designs of the engines and the manufacturing processes were all done to be as profitable as possible. And although that resulted in lots of cars being sold, those cars often broke down or they were dogged by problems. And I think particularly of BMW, Mercedes and Audi, and it's probably unfair just to pick on those three, but three German brands that are synonymous with reliability and performance have had lots of problems on cars that have been made during the financial crisis. And even in recent years, there's been a lot of frustrating problems that just kept cropping up with a lot of these engines. Thankfully, they do seem to be getting a handle on it and things do seem to be improving. But it's a cynical view to take, isn't it, that manufacturers are just making cars so they will break down after the warranty period just to force people to go out and buy replacement parts or to go out and get a new car. It's forcing people into the always having a new car um, when it gets to three or five years old. It's no good for anyone. But I certainly don't hold that cynical view of planned obsolescence myself. I think it's just a result of manufacturers trying to make a profit, trying to maybe even cut corners in the manufacturing and they've just let the quality stay 
standards dip. But that has really hammered their reputation in a lot of cases. We've had the recent diesel scandals with the emissions regulations from most leading manufacturers, and it has done nothing to restore people's confidence in the motor industry. So in recent years, I think manufacturers are making a lot more of an effort. Now, one other thing that we really do need to mention that's really transformed the performance of cars is tyres and tyre technology. So much research and development has gone into your modern tyre. We're seeing cars that are lapping the Nürburgring as quickly as some of the early supercars were of maybe 20 or 30 years ago. And most of that is down to the quality of the tyres, the tyre design, the compounds that have been used. There's an element of the differentials that have been used in the suspension setup obviously but being able to drive a family car that is relatively cheap to run that outperforms some of those early supercars must give each one of those owners a satisfied feeling and maybe that sense of smugness that they're getting away with all the running costs and expenses but at the end of the day it probably would be nicer to drive a Lamborghini or a Ferrari although the running costs are prohibitively expensive so take it as a win that you've got a decent performing car and we can go out now much like motorsports teams they would choose a tyre for a track depending on the weather conditions we can go out and buy winter weather tyres ice and snow tyres would be included as well you've got summer tyres you've got track tyres you've got road legal slicks so there's a big choice now of tyres and different types of rubber that you can put on your car and that really is the critical component your car's performance its acceleration its braking and its cornering is so solely down to the amount of grip that can be provided by those tyres. So by focusing a lot of effort on your tyre choice, the dimensions of the tyre, the profile, the tread pattern, the compounds of the tyre, you can do a lot to enhance the performance and handling of your car in every aspect. Don't ever underlook the importance of choosing good quality rubber for your car. So tuning cars today may well be harder than it was in bygone ages because the manufacturers have done a lot of the optimising yourself. You've got a fairly polished, finished product to work with. But with the advent of modern computers, modern technology and the array of performance parts on offer, there certainly is a lot more to choose from and a lot more scope to choose cars. It's just sad that in some areas, tuning cars and modifying them has become illegal or highly frowned upon by the authorities. When actually in a lot of cases, you're improving the car, you are making it safer, it can handle better, it can stop more quickly and the engine is more efficient. So unless you're driving at the high speeds and accelerating hard, you'll be getting better better fuel economy potentially than an untuned car just running around in a normal driver's hands. So I hope this video has been interesting to you. I would love to hear your experiences of tuning the world of cars over the years. And um, what's your opinion of the way that tuning cars has changed and evolved over the years? What are your thoughts on tuning cars and modifying them? And generally the availability of performance parts in your area for your specific model of car. So thanks for watching. We'd love you to stay tuned, so please subscribe if you haven't done so, and please boot that like button because that really helps us to get out there. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.